Hi, Andy. This is Dr. Cohen, and I was calling you back about some results from our last appointment. So that rash that was on your genitals, you don't have to worry about it. It is not an STD like you were worried. I think it was some chafing. So I would definitely recommend, you know, just keep putting creams on it and then maybe start wearing underwear. Um, you know, with all of that pubic hair that you have there, it can definitely cause some irritation or maybe, you know, maybe trim down a little and then... I wanted to kind of touch base on what we talked about. There are different forms of male birth control that are available, such as creams and stuff. But, Andy, unlike women, men don't have days where their sperm is not viable, right? So if you have sexual intercourse with your girlfriend, and you come inside of her, your sperm can still get women pregnant any day of the month, okay? So just keep that in mind. Please continue to use protection. And if you have any more questions, just please call me, and we will talk soon. Bye-bye. And we're back. Andy Frasco's World Saving Podcast. Woo! I'm Andy Frasco, yep. and this is my fearless sidekick, mm. Nick Gerlock, going I, to Rockies games by himself. I went to the Rockies game by myself yesterday, and I had a blast. Did you eat a hot dog? I didn't. I had some popcorn, though. It was so weird. We went to the game, what, last week? Yeah, Two weeks ago? Something like that. Like, I'm like, I'm going to get a sausage. You're like, I'm going to get a coffee. They don't serve coffee at the... Yeah, they do. No. Yeah. It's just only hot coffee. You should have more... Coffee options, Rockies. You need to have some nice lattes. <laughs> it's perfect on a Sunday afternoon. A nice I don't know latte. if I could fuck with like, like a arena food. Nah, it's kind of state fairish, shouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's why I didn't. That's why I just got popcorn. I didn't really feel like having a meal at the ballpark. I'm not really into fair food. No, I don't like. St- you know what stunt food is? No, stunt foods like when you go to the state fair and they like deep fry a Snickers bar or like <laughs> some crazy steak with other stuff inside of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, Where it's yeah, like yeah. overdone. I hate that shit. I, 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 I do too, but I was at jazz fest and the food was fire. Jazz fest doesn't count. It's like a different new Orleans is new Orleans. Doesn't like whenever you say something fire about society, new Orleans doesn't count. Yeah. Neither does Vegas. I think like, Why? cause that's what they're for. They're like the Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what I mean? It's where you go to fuck. <laughs> You have to express the duality of man. You know what I mean? I feel that. So, like, they don't, that that doesn't apply to them. But, you know, I just don't, the stunt food, it's also sort of, it's kind of why I hate cooking. I hate cooking shows. Why? Because there's, like, starving people in the world, and then, like, there's also people <laughs> doing little fucking art projects with their food for points. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I guess I'm being a bitch about it, too, but, like, I think I have a point. Like, there's, like, people that, like, would love to just eat out of the trash if they can. Do you like promoters? What do you mean? Just band promoters and music pr- promoters. How good are they? Are they the, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, you're so right. So is Guy Fieri kind of like a music promoter? You think so? No, because he can actually make food. Most promoters can't play music for shit. That's why, <laughs> that's why they got on that side of the business. That's true. Speaking of being a music promoter, Summer Camp Music Festival. Kill it, killing it. It's going to be fun. Yeah, the lineup's insane. I looked at the uh, schedule. You're playing the last, the last set on one. Sunday. They're like, who... Who can perfect. handle the perfect? You guys are perfect for that role. I, Your two AM set's different though. It's the last thing of the whole festival, so it's more of an like a like the closing ceremonies of the Olympics. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think that you need to approach it. <laughs> maybe even like maybe you should like as your gimmick for that come up with some closing. I'm not going to help you because I'm not going to be there and you're not going to pay me. But think of some <laughs> ideas where you could make it like a closing ceremony. Oh, the like whole a festival. like a, like we should do present a torch? something to Ian or something. That's actually a funny idea. It's a pretty idea. good idea. Yeah. And then, like, maybe, I don't know, what do they do with the presenting? <laughs> Dude, actually, you just gotta stay up I have a all great day. idea. All got? the bands are still there. Line them up like the countries at the Olympic parade. <laughs> and during one of your songs, have them all hold up signs for what their band is. And then they all walk through with their signs, like whoever it is. I don't know. Disco. Oh, I'm looking. clapping to that. That's brilliant, man. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a little bit like the opening ceremonies, but you can make it work. And then maybe it's something. Like, hold on, what is it? Is it this the summer one? camp torch? There needs to be a no. summer camp torch. 
Wow. Where the fuck is it? Right. Oh my god. Oh, where's our Oscar music? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I think you replaced it, but I think that'd be great. And then maybe, I don't know, what else do they do at the closing ceremony? That is so fucking funny. Dude, Wait, bands everyone... will do that. They're all going to be drunk up their asses. Have them all make a little stupid sign. Or a flag that they put over their... over <laughs> Something. And then they're each led by one person. I fucking love it. Yeah, I like that that's too. Shake, or that's you can nice. have fans do it with what state they're from too. Just have the whole crowd do it. Just put whatever you are in a stick. Now you're getting me pumped up Identity for the 2 a.m. set. What? Now you're getting me pumped up for the 2 a.m. set. Dude, that's the fun set. Now, 2 a.m. on Friday? No. I don't want to be in like the 2 a.m. in the middle of everybody's... Because here's the problem with playing those late nights. On paper, when you're coming up, I used to play a lot. Because when you're kind of a come-up band, they stick you there. Yeah. Because they think, and they're right, people will stay up to see like the cool up-and-coming electronic things uh -huh. for drugs, you know? Right. But then you start to realize that the people that come to see you at three in the morning are fucking, no offense, but they're wasted. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're supposed to be wasted. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, the, that's what's going on here. Yeah. It's a, it's a New Orleans, Las Vegas situation. Right. But. Sunday. This is like the. But that's different. You're the last thing. It's more of a thing. Yeah. But when you're doing it on Friday, you're like, yeah, sweet, we're playing the late night. It's almost better to play at 4 p.m., I think. Sometimes. I love the daytime set at a festival. People remember you more. It's just fun. You then you get the whole night to party. You feel good. Your yeah. adrenaline's fucking jacked. Just you play a show. Come up. You you're like, I'm going to go party with the You've fans. You've a couple Red Bull and Vodkas. Yeah, I, I love like, that. I like to have those at festivals. 2 a.m., I got to like hide like a Loch Ness monster yeah. because like I don't want to get drunk. Andy. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't like... And that's the worst thing. I hate staying backstage at those fucking music Dangerous. festivals. They're all just... It's just kind of stiff. And everyone's like waiting to gig. So like you can't really have like great conversations. And everybody's conversations. tired because they're all like... They're all on like 12 hours of travel. No yeah. one's ever coming in fresh to a festival. No. Except for like bands that are like regional, the regional 1 p.m. band that's just like happy that they got meal yeah. tickets, you know? Every other band is like flying. Don't you miss in... those days, kind of? Oh, yeah. One just time my girlfriend, there. she only worked a festival one time ever, and it was Artist Relations. And she like was like, she hated it, actually. She did it one time. She's like, I'm never doing this again. Uh, this band came up, and they were like, I don't even know who it was. They were like some local band that like barely got on the festival, and they like got meal tickets, and the guy's like, oh, my God. He was like so excited about getting meal tickets. <laughs> Dude, and she's what? like, you're a dick. Because I'm always like, where's catering? Yeah, yeah. Where's catering? And this guy's like, oh, my God, they're going to give us some potatoes. Uh, and Yeah, like the worst <laughs> meal. It was, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, catering is the fucking worst God, at festivals. Like, but remember that phase of your life? <laughs> don't you remember that phase of your life? I love. Why can't we have that same energy going into our life thinking about 15 this. years later? You, you would think you'd be more excited now. You're go playing Red Rocks. Yeah. But you're not. <laughs> no, it's more stressful. You're more excited to drive four hours and get like 250 bucks between... Eight people, including right. crew, because you got a goddamn free lunch, which was like a sandwich and chips. Yeah, I used to be excited to go to towns. I'm like, oh yeah, they had great bar food. So, what do you think it is? Do you think it's because it's like you're feeling you're finally included in this like world you sort of mystify yeah. or mystify by? Is that part of it? Could be because by now, like the curtain has been lifted for us. Yeah, we've seen we've all we've seen the dark side of the industry. We've seen the good. We've side. We've seen the wizard. He's a dickhead. <laughs> he sucks. He's not that cool, and he, he wants fifteen percent, you know, <laughs> or forty, <laughs> or forty, or sixty. <laughs> I was looking at some of my uh, some of my deals, and I, I used to get frustrated when I would think like the venue is going to take forty percent of the door. <laughs> it's like, and are I'm you like, selling booze? Yeah, you should negotiate lower ticket sales because they know they're going to do an extra twenty in booze sales at your show. I know, but it's also now that you're at a point where now promoters are renting out the room, so it's not like the, it's it. the venue's fault. It's like everyone's got to get their piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much. I know of venues where like bands go and they sell out and they break even, maybe, and there's ten thousand people there. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Or they lose money. That's why I told Brian, put me at a bodegas. I want to do a bodega <laughs> tour. That would be fun. And that's too small though. The boat you need something yeah. bigger. But I like where you're going. Like, like how uh, like who's that? Uh, Bert Kreischer. He's doing like a tour in my baseball league. stadium. That's so cool, right? Minor baseball. So what you, you need to do something like that, but smaller and more on your brand. Like, we're going to local roller rinks. See, that'd be cool. It's just, if you guys play in a roller rink and everybody could roller skate. That sounds like a liability. It does sound like a liability. But since when have you cared about that? We're going to crowd surf while you rollerblade me to the back of the room. Well, just like, since when have you given a shit about a liability? You have a well, now I'm older, that takes I, you 12 feet off the ground. Well, I, I blew out my back deadlifting fucking 
Floyd at Summer He's or, big at Don't, Jazz Fest. He weighs more than you do, I man, bet. I'm getting old. I had to go to a chiropractor. Cairo, man. It was cool because he's in the scene. This guy Nate, shout out to Nate, hooking me up. You need chiropractor, go to this dude. He's dope. Is he good? Yeah. I'm, I'm a little sports medicine. Okay, so he's like a real one. He's real. You know, like some of them you can't Yeah. I don't want to say anything about And I like it because we could like, you know, we're, we're he understands why. He hot? He's hot. A lot of chiropractors are. He's like buff hot. Asian dude. I've never seen a non buff. Every chiropractor is ripped. Yeah. You have to be. They're all hot and ripped. Man, I gotta shout out to all these doctors and chiropractors who are who are really taking care of musicians yeah. without insurance and like giving them the homie to, deals. Uh, shout out to not the federal government of the United States. What's going on? I'm just saying because the healthcare thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's more of an issue where people don't think musicians is a career. Right. And you know, on some level they're correct. <laughs> Here's the problem with it. I'm not, it's like anybody can just say they're a musician. True. So like, you can't just be like, I'm like, if I just walked around calling myself an accountant, mm -hmm. no one would be like, yeah, he's an accountant. You have to like have a degree. You know what I mean? So like, that's the thing is like, yeah, you're a musician, but all these people, most of the musicians they know, like play like one show a month and like are living this weird life where they tell everyone they're a musician, but yeah. actually they work at a store. You know uh -huh. what I mean? And they're not actually actually trying that hard to be a musician either. It's just like a phase in their life. Uh -huh. So that's what they think of when they think of musician, you know? Is that a quarter life If crisis? everybody, like, if you were the main musician, everybody knew that uh, the opinion of the career would probably be different, right? Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, but can you say it is a ridiculous thing to do. You know, there's people out there, like, putting out fires and working in hospitals. So it's like... I think those are... I think music's just as important, bud. Uh, okay, I get it. Like, on a, like, a emotional level. Mm -hmm. But they're not as like, it's not as much of a service. But it, it can be a service. We're better than hedge fund managers. Nick, you are. I'm saying we're somewhere between like. You dedicated your life to this craft right. of music and so, you're so I don't belittling like, it. I'm not belittling it. I'm saying we're somewhere between like uh, children's hospital nurse and hedge fund manager. <laughs> we're probably like in there somewhere. Our tour manager, Bo, is with the people. He does merch for us. When I know. We don't have a merch. Is music important? Yeah, I'm not saying it's not important. My point is good here, I think. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so we... Oh, we're not saving anybody's life, like, physically. So we're narcissists. No, we're not. Well, everyone's a narcissist about something, probably. So right? we think we're more important than we really no, are. No, some people, like, get a little dramatic about what a musician's role... That's all I'm saying is, like, it's cool that you're doing this. And, like, yes, you do help people, everyone. Like, it's good for the world to have music. But there's also, like, a shit ton of people that just want to play musician and, like, pretend they're musicians. They kind of uh, water down the industry you know the career a little bit also you know like not you know there's a lot of musicians that if they didn't exist the world would not be any different you know what fuck that musicians don't let fucking nick I say they're like don't a let seven. nick ruin your dream i'm sorry i think people that like you make, fucking be that person you want to be fucking you want to be uh, well i'm just like saying like someone who saves a kid's life in a hospital is more important than a jazz saxophonist <laughs> But I'm still better than a hedge fund manager <laughs> or like a, you know, or like some sort of slumlord. Wow. Like, Good morning, Nicholas Gerlach. If there Gerlach. are 10, musicians are like a six or a seven. Well, for, um, for the people who... Um, I think I'm being pretty fair here, Bo, don't you? Okay. You agree? No, no. Fuck that. It's everything. I think you think I'm being a little harder on musicians than I am. We're not monsters or anything, <laughs> but we're not angels either. Speaking of being an angel, Repsy.com is yeah. a great angel for uh, musicians. Great angel. And a great angle. And a great angle. So if you can't read, they work either way. <laughs> <laughs> Sign up to Repsy.com. If you're in a band, if you're a comedian or... Um, magician. Magician or a shit talker like Nick Gerlach. I'm not yeah. talking shit. <laughs> you're some weird musician guy that doesn't have any gigs because you're not actually a musician and you're just calling yourself a musician to hit on girls at bars or whatever. Perfect. <laughs> Sign up for Repsy.com. They'll book you a gig at a college bar. Collegio. Collegio. Or a fret party. A fret party. <laughs> or a wedding. Oh, yeah? They do weddings? They do. They book bands for weddings. Damn. I fuck with that. That's crazy. All my bandmates are getting married this week. Really? Oh, Floyd Ernie, and Ernie. Floyd's getting married in Nantucket. You're not going, right? I'm going to that Wait, when's sure. the Floyd wedding? Floyd wedding's in two weeks. Hey, thanks for that invite, Floyd. So that wedding's in Nantucket. We're going to be there for three days. We're going to go to an island that we can't Here, afford because we're broke. <laughs> the time. Make sure you show up. 
And then Ernie's getting a loaded. Is it a loaded? Oh, man. That's not even the word. Elopement. There's no D. Elopement. He's eloping. He's Him and Amy, shout out to them as well. They're getting married in Hawaii wow. this weekend. And Sean's already married. Sean's already married. That means I am the last of the Mohegans. I mean, everyone knew that was going <laughs> to. So sign up for Repsy.com. So sign up for Repsy.com. <laughs> and then, um, but yeah, you know, some of these band, I hear these. Nightmares of these wives just like well, not you know, enjoying to be fair, the husband being let's a not traveling put it all musician. On the women, it could be that they have a terrible band boyfriend. Or well, true, husband. or husband. It could be a girl in I a think band. People that, are just kind of crazy with their significant. And others. I know the other side of it, where I have a homegirl who's in a band. She's extremely hot and like super talented, and her boyfriend is jealous as fuck and gets all nervous and really and like hits her up all the time, and it's just like makes her feel threatened. Yeah, so it it's just like more of a human thing. It's a human thing. Yeah. It's 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 a thing where you being away all the time. It's not just men or women. It's everything. not everyone's built for that, and it's actually okay if you're not built for that. It's actually yeah. normal. Just get out of the relationship if you don't feel like. I know it's like it's be weird to be in a new thing, but if it's not clicking and you know you're going to be a musician forever, get the fuck out. Right? I'll clap to that. Yeah, relax with some dialed in gummies. <laughs> some dialed in gummies. Let's talk about them a little bit too. Um, our other sponsor, Dialed in Gummies. No, I'll be, to be thinking about relaxing. Yeah, sleepy. You time. know, I was, I was on a weed hiatus. Really? Yeah, like not smoking during the day. I started smoking during the day again, but because I've been taking these Dialed in Gummies, and I love them. They do be hitting. I take half. You, I mean, you pounded through your fucking case of these in like a couple days. Well, yeah, but one of the one of the cases they gave me was already half eaten, so well, I don't know. What I, I took half of them. <laughs> I like them. Uh, yeah, they get me pretty high. I, I eat like thirty or forty milligrams. You want one? Yeah, they're fucking good. Can you chew in the mic a little louder for me? I love that sound. I you think, do. Mm -hmm. So weird. My sister would murder you. She's one of those people that like. I had a fan who's like a big a. Is it ASMR? Yeah. AMSR she's like a m. Yeah, I don't she's know, one of those things. She's like she does really well, makes a ton of money doing mm -hmm. it. I'm like, she's like, I'm like, kind of. We were kind of talking, flirting a little bit a couple years ago. I'm like, will you send me one of those ASMR videos of you just like chewing food and like mm -hmm. clicking your nails and shit? I was like, just to see if I could like be turned on by it. And I was fucking turned on by yeah, it. Yeah, but dude. what doesn't turn you don't on? like this sound? I just feel like it's not that hard to get you horny. Like. It, these days it is. Oh, my libido is gone. Really? Yeah. Maybe you need to like start doing cardio. Yeah, and I think I'm. I haven't exercised in a while, and I don't drink enough water. Mm. And and you have a girlfriend now. Yeah, nothing sucks the life out of you like being in a relationship. <laughs> We're actually good. Dialed in gummies. <laughs> so eat some dialed in gummies if you uh, if um, if you like. They're out of Colorado, and they're always sold out. So if you see them, if you're in Colorado and you see them. At the medicinal shops. Buy as many as you can. Buy as many as you can because they're fucking good. I'm not, and I'm not just blowing smoke up their ass because they pay us. No, but we are doing that too. <laughs> a little bit. But no, seriously, uh, get some dialed in gummies. They're great. Solventless. And, and if, no, they clean. Do, yeah. And the cool thing about this is they do, they, all they, their business is to collab with growers. So if you like a certain strand of weed out of Colorado or wherever they are, I guarantee you, they probably have a gummy that has that weed in it. So, shout out to Dialed in Gummies. It's That's so a good. smart business. Smart business. And it tastes so good like yeah. good candy. QR code. Do the QR code thing. And then there's a QR code. Um, the hard way. We're going to have a good week. I'm going to go to Powell. Yeah, baby. I'm going. Are you going with a group? Um, yeah, I'm going with a couple of the Umphreys dudes. Which ones? Um, you know, Ben. Yeah, he lives in Indiana. He's, he's lived in Indiana. Well, yeah. not anymore, but he used to live there forever. Him and his uh, girlfriend, ben, I call him. Ray Ray. I call him Hot Ben. Yeah. Going out with Rick Alden on his boat. Oh, this is like your yearly. Yeah, my yearly trip. I thought you usually do this in like January. Yeah, we, we're doing, no, we do it later in August normally, but oh. we wanted to do it in May while so Arizona is just so fucking hot. And also, like Powell, like, is really dry right now. Julie's so in Arizona right now. We got to like go deep into the lake, really? which is tight. But you sleep on the boat? Yeah. It's like a yacht or uh, like a houseboat. It's like a yacht. Yeah, 10 person, 10 bedroom it houseboat. Scary? It's the best trip. Is it serene? There's like four jet skis. What do you do all day? We, I, 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 we wake surf. We got like For a power hours boat. Hours and hours? Yeah. 
And it's we, just so pretty. We'll take acid. Do and, you just fall asleep at like 7 p.m. every night from being out of... Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's sometimes nothing to do, but also there's times where you stay up all night. But I'll does take Rick acid and like look at some ride mountains his bike and down shit. There? Um, no, but I'm bringing, I'm Kick bringing the Kakuzas, FYI. <laughs> they're coming. Hell yeah. They're like your, bringing Jill. They're like your carry on when you go on vacation. I do. Whenever I want to have they're like a carry on. I do. Whenever I want to have a real great vacation, I always ask. Did you know when, when Andy books come. a frontier flight, there's like a little checkbox for 65 bucks per Kakuza. <laughs> 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 oh man, you're killing me today, buddy. I'm very funny and witty. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be fun. So I'll be back on Tuesday. So cool. We have to end this. I know we do. Um, because our the people who are now in charge of us, they're not really in charge of us. Well, we got a letter of people who are interested in the set podcast. Yeah, but podcast. we still got to be ourselves a little bit, you know. I know. Plus, this was a good one. We got right into it. Yeah, we got into it. And well, you know, we don't really get to hang out as much anymore. I know. That's but why you, we're going to do the side podcast. This is what happens. I put you on the payroll, and all of a sudden you forget about me. Yep. <laughs> Got my money, I'm out. <laughs> When's that next when do you need me? You don't call. You don't want to play video games with me anymore. Every time I got to force you to play NBA 2K with me. I've been playing. I know, but you don't just... You well, normally just come over. outside of you. No, you don't. Okay. You have me. How much do you think you're paying me? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> but I'm your friend. And we, we're friends before we're we are friends, business and the partners. The more you pay me, the more I will say we're friends. All right, fine. All right, guys. Have a great week. Um, Bye. Be safe. Who's, who's the interview? Um, Magic City Hippies. Ooh, and, Florida. And Or, if I get this on time, <laughs> Corey Henry. Oh, cool. I love that guy. Yeah, I'm excited to interview him. Mm-hmm. But if I, don't, if I don't get it on time this week. You guys are both organists. Yeah. You both well, play the organ. He's a master. <laughs> I know. It's funny that you both master. call yourself organ. I love organ. Yeah. I like the organ better than the piano. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Also, we got to start writing my new record. You ready? <laughs> Am I writing your records now? You're going to help me write a song. I had a good song idea already today. What? You had Car- a song idea? The Karma one, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, Bo's got to get out of here. Bo, you have a great week. Where's Bo going? Bo's moving out soon. What? He wow. found a spot. I'm sad. GoFundMe dude. finally came through. Are you going to still come over here? Okay, good. GoFundMe. Like, you should work from here. This should be your office. Do you still work for the other You're management like, nah. company, too? <laughs> you still he work works for, the- for 7S, too. Yeah. Yeah, instead of going- yeah, instead of going to Brian's, he's coming to Frasco's. I'm like the cool uncle, okay? You yeah. ever have to go to Brian Schwartz's house? Fuck that. You come to my house, okay? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. We got to go. We're just talking now. And they told us not to do this. Tighten it up, guys. They said tighten it up. Stop just talking about everything. Time, it was good. I thought it was good. We also were, fuck them. Yeah, also fuck them. Okay. Enjoy Magic City Hippies or Corey I'm going to be Henry. me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to be me. You want to give them a little motivation? Not really. Okay. Bye. Next up on the interview hour, we have Magic City Hippies. Yes. Florida boys. Hey, Chris, play some Magic City Hippies. Um, we got to play with these guys maybe a couple of years ago um, in North Carolina. And it was, I, seeing the crowd response was fucking awesome. People were singing all the songs, crying with them. It was fucking tight. So I wanted to interview these guys and then I did a little more research on them. And they got a great story. And I think you're going to really love this interview, actually. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the interview hour for the summer camp installment. Magic City Hippies. <laughs> what's up, buddy? What's up, man? How you doing? So what's going on? Where are you? I'm, <laughs> Why in, can't you... I'm, in, I'm in the Mall of the Americas right now. In honestly. Minnesota? In Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> they canceled three of my flights. Dude. I, I, I can't get to Miami right now. <laughs> did you play a festival out there? What was going on? You did a couple runs or what? No, no. I, I've just been hanging out in Montana just like hiking writing songs and shit it's just been gorgeous you know and like so anytime that we go on tour you know we're playing summer camp so you know fly down to miami and rehearse and then hike up to you know illinois but uh yeah it's just been crazy the clay you know canceling flights left and right right now so they literally canceled three of my flights so now i'm gonna go to atlanta lay over for like 10 hours and then fly to miami 
which is crazy. But you know, that's, that's fucking where we are. dude. That's insane because like. I, I've been dealing with this a lot too. We're, do, we're doing that flying thing where we have to book 45 fucking flights for everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just worried some of these shows aren't going to happen <laughs> because for all sure. the fucking flights are getting canceled. Know, you, don't, you don't hear me at all? Yo, yeah, bud. What's up? Well, what's up? That was my level. Not too, not too crazy. You sound That's great. Awesome. That's beautiful. We got. <laughs> We got fucking Magic City hippies up in here. This has been a long time coming, guys. We've been trying to do this for like six months. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of scheduling. <laughs> yeah, I worked out. So um, that's so crazy, Rob. So what? tell me a little bit why you wanted to go to, um, why'd you want to go to Montana to chill out? <laughs> I guess it kind of happened during the COVID days. I, you know, I mean, to be honest, you know, I met a girl out there. And, okay, let's go. Know, let's go. You know, so. That kind of thing happened, but it's just, you know, we toured through it's, you know, Bozeman's on the routing, you know, uh, of the, the tour that we go on the winter tour, pretty much. Every it's always time. a great show. Bozeman is always yeah. a lit show, even before really? you marry. That's fucking awesome. And I never, you know, I never expected to like kind of end up hanging out in Montana, but my God it's so fucking beautiful out there. It, it is. is unbelievable. It's crazy. And it's very fucking different than Miami. You know, like it's, it's the polar oh opposite. Well, yeah. maybe that's why you like it. You know, it's I like, think so. I think so. Yeah. It's like, um, we live this high, fast paced life, our whole, this whole existence. And like, we just need some, some form of qu- slowdown. Yeah. And it, absolutely, it took yeah. you to butt fuck Montana to fucking finally <laughs> slow it down, Rob. Because like, I heard this story, bro. Like you, your band you used to be a busker in Miami. That how it oh, started. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how it started. Yeah, in the streets of Coconut Grove. Give me, give me the like, deets. Were you making okay. money? Give me everything. Yeah. I don't. I mean, <laughs> no I barely know you. <laughs> Every, we've probably told the story a couple of times. No one's ever pointed out, like, hey man, like you probably weren't making a lot of money doing that, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> a couple of times, people would drop like hundred dollar bills, you know, down, which was pretty sick, you know, back in the day. But I'd say I'd average like sixty bucks a night. You know, not too bad. Let's fucking go. I like it. <laughs> It's more than we made it our first gig, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. So tell me about the busking, and then tell me how you met the boys, and we'll get, we'll yeah, get yeah. the brothers in here. So, like, you know, I was just, I was just like, fuck it. I just want to play music on the street. So I would, I noticed that there was, like, a power outlet above a bank, and then I would just kind of, like, climb the awning and stick an extension cord in there and just power my, like, speakers and nobody gave a shit. Like they just let me play for like a year and it was like fun. I had a good following. A lot of like college 20 somethings would come and hang out and dance. And eventually like five cops came and like, look, we're going to arrest you. If you don't like shut this shit down, like, what? You gotta stop get a Oof. real gig, you know? So then I started playing at this bar called the Barracuda bar. They took pity on me, I guess. And um, that's where the boys came in. I started like playing with these local kind of UM musicians I met Pat at first, who is soon to come and join us, I think. Uh, he introduced me to John, and we started playing these, like, trio gigs for free beer. Right. Uh, we were Not all $60. Yeah. We were very impressed with Robbie's stories of $60 in the past. Huh? <laughs> so, John, what did, so what did you see in Robbie that made you want to just, like, f- quit everything and... A part of it. Well, I mean, so me, yeah, me and Pat, we're going to UM uh, studying music, and I think we were about to graduate like the next year, or it was around the time we were finishing. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And so Pat and Robbie were actually playing duo gigs a lot of times. So the first time I met Robbie was uh, Robbie just got back from Argentina, and it was him and Pat at Jada Coles, and uh, I remember being like, "Man, they can really use a bass player," <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I mean, I play guitar. Let me turn it on a little bit. I think I'm peaking. Uh, I um, not that, not not this type of peaking. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, you know, play guitar in the band now, and on the records, I play guitar and everything. But you know, we needed. I could tell they needed a bass player. I mean, they sounded great. Don't get me wrong. And uh, I was living with Pat, and I remember you were playing some. Thir- I, I I don't remember most of the gigs. We've played you know thousands. It feels like, but you were playing in a place called the Joint, which I don't think exists anymore. And it was a Thursday. Yeah, and I remember I was like packing up to go play, and I was like, "We're all like broke, you know, twenty-one year olds, you know, like eating fried egg sandwiches like three days, three times a day to survive." And I was like, "Pat, like, I'll come. I got nothing to do, man. I would love to come play this gig, you know." And 
I remember, you know, there is Pat the, your it, homie. Is that like your best friend? Yeah. I mean, Pat's like my musical, like, there's, you know, he, he lives in LA and I'm still in Miami, so we don't see each other that much. When it comes to music, there's no one that I just feel like, I don't, this is not the best metaphor, but it's like we have an umbilical cord attaching both of our belly buttons. You know, there's like a laser between our brains that it just makes sense. There's no one whose music ideas just click with mine more, you know? How did, um, how did you meet Pat? Like, was it through the dorm? Were you guys fucking the same chicks? Like, give, give me the it's scoop. Uh, we, were, we were both in music school, uh, but it was another friend of ours, uh, Jack, uh, who is a good friend, lives in New York now. And he moved into the hippie castle, Jack. With Wait, me hold on. House. What's the hippie castle? All right. So, so we'll go backwards. So I moved, I moved into this house um, that had been in music school for years. So like every year, like a new kind of new group of music school students moved in. Uh, and I moved in kind of with the outgoing people. And then so I had to kind of fill a house with my own friends. So I brought in a friend, Stephanie. I brought in Jack. And Jack was friends with Pat. He brought uh-huh. in Pat. I was like, this guy is so nice. He's very cool, very laid back, more responsible than the rest of us. You know, if anyone was missing rent, he'd, hey, Pat, we're talking about you. Hey, right. I'm hey, walking, I'm walking hey. right into some compliments. This is yeah. Welcome to the show, Pat. What's up, Doug? Let's go. LA living. Look at you guys, just fucking bi coastal like pimps. I love it. This is great. And then poor it Robbie, is, the, the lead dude's in fucking Minnesota right now. <laughs> it's a full circle event tonight. So, John was talking to me about how you guys met. So, you guys met at this, the mansion, the hippie mansion. What is it? Yeah, sounds mansion. like a, oh, yeah. it sounds no, like a porn know. den or like a, <laughs> what's the hippie I, mansion? You know what? That might have, that might have. I don't know if we asked enough questions to our our landlord and and our neighbor about that. That might have that might have gone down at some point. Honestly, it had that vibe to it. it very seventies uh, Miami bungalow. Was it sticky? I, oh, <laughs> at times. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you guys know. met at the mansion. You two, you um, Pat and John, and then it, you guys are twenty years old, living the dream, going to U of M, going to Miami. You see fucking Robbie <laughs> playing some fucking little bar and you're like we need to make this happen like what'd you see in what'd you see in robbie pat i met robbie i want to say like 15 minutes before we played our first show together so there was literally it was kind of like a friend of a friend like revolving door situation with um people like starting to accompany him with his one-man band thing Mm -hmm. at the cuda and yeah i had a friend named sean who was a killing bass player and and had started to play with robbie robbie would be looping beatboxing um, I had never seen it before. This was all like told to me. It's like, oh, this guy playing, you know, playing at Barracuda Bar and the girl, like kind of one of the I'd say at that point, the diviest spot in the grove. At this point, you know, it's it's doing some it's it's not it hasn't changed at all, but it's it's <laughs> like an institution and it's doing its yeah. thing. But uh but yeah, I I remember showing up, I was like, Yeah, I'm down. Like I kind of had no way to I don't know, I wasn't really going out, you know, with my you know, people had like, you know, IDs and were like going to like, uh, you know, Club Live on a Wednesday night with like <laughs> kids, there, kids there, you know, like, you know, in school from like Europe with like a Black American Express card. And I don't know. It was just like, yeah, I'll do that. I'd, I'd love to just start playing on, on Friday nights. So I said, yes, there was no discussion of pay or anything like that. And then, yeah, like I remember I'd pull up my 97 Honda Accord and I got my kick drums like taken off the lining of my door or whatever. I try to get it out of it. And like, dude's like, hey, I'm Robbie, nice to meet you. Helps me carry my kick drum in. And then we played for like totally unrehearsed for like, I don't know, three hours, something like that, you know, just kind of reacting to to certain like sublime covers, hip hop covers, um, you know, some original tunes he had. And I think it was the first time uh, I ever was like really grooving with like a guitar player. Uh-huh. You know, when you find it, you kind of have the same pocket or right. just, just the, the, the tacit like musical chemistry. You know what I mean? We were just on, on the grid. I could tell we were both pretty like satisfied. Like we were having, you know, there's like, there's, there's smiles. It was all smiles. And yeah, I just it's proceeded important. to do that for the subsequent, I don't know, however many Fridays in a row. It was just like, all right, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Was, right. That's what's important is like the, the beginning of the band is like, like Pat said, like you just get on stage and Robbie would start a loop. And shut the fuck up. It's yeah. like good luck. Yeah, exactly. Started, I mean, they were very simple loops, Robbie. I, I love but, you, and they were very straightforward, simple loops. But you know, with our musical training or whatever, we would just you know listen. It was, and what's really nice is because of that, you had to kind of listen before you played. It'd be like, let me listen. He's doing this. What would be the best thing to compliment this? Instead of mm-hmm. like, man, I love to 
played the sick ass line. And so it kind of created almost like a produced version of it live. We we're, were kind of more thinking like what serves the song a little more. Didn't really have a lot of licks to whip out. And because of that, we without ever having talking about what the songs are, we developed like a 20, 30, three sets worth of music without ever even talking about what the chords are, you know, what we're going to play, how we're going to play it. Sick. And that, so organic. I think. Every every moment was compelling and was musical genius. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we were never. Doing- <laughs> at, <laughs> yeah, at um, Barracuda's Titty Bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Robbie, I, I got a question for you, buddy. What? So you have these guys come in. They're music school guys. And I'm assuming you you don't have that type of training, right? No. Okay. Not. Yeah, you're a busker. Me too. This is how I... What it Was it intimidating to get these music school guys joining your band at first? Like, did you feel like you were good enough? Did you feel like you needed to do more? Did you feel like, oh, fuck these guys. These guys are too smart for me. <laughs> it's funny. Um... I don't know. I don't think I ever felt that way. You know, I mean, at times like later on where it's like, you know, they're like busting out a lot of their knowledge. And like when we were like writing songs and stuff together, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not that it's intimidating. It's just, it's, it's useful. You know, it's like, it's very nice to have that. Right. I think there was something that I just knew that I had that was kind of like real and raw. And it was like, I don't know how other how many other people had it. So I kind of felt good about it. I felt secure about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just doing my thing. I was just like, fuck it. It's yeah. not a big deal. You know? Cause I remember we played with each other in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Yes. And I saw Happy, these, Happy I saw these festival. women going nuts over you guys singing every song. I'm like, dude, these guys are fucking hot. I'm like, yeah. it, how long did it take between you? I heard you guys were the Robbie Hunter band. And then you guys turned into Magic City Hippies. How long did it take for you to feel like, all right, instead of being a solo act, I want to make this a full band project. And give me like the process of when that happened and like, were you guys starting to do bigger gigs? Were you trying to get out of Miami? Like, what was the thought process of changing it from your name into a a band name? Yeah. I mean, we named our first album Magic City Hippies. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. And that... uh, (laughs) It kind of like dawned on us, you know, that this the Robbie Hunter band is a stupid name, and we need to kind of <laughs> <laughs> yo fuck we that name. To, <laughs> we got to upgrade. Uh, you know? well, no, to Robbie, to Robbie's credit and humility and everything. Like me and John, so we were already you know playing the three of us in Robbie Hunter band. Like nothing changed lineup wise between Robbie Hunter band and Magic City Hippies. It was just like us, you know, shedding that skin and like something that felt a little more like the project. But uh, I remember we were like, well, Robbie, like, you know, these are your songs. Like me and John are kind of are playing on this, like we're I'm producing this, but like, it's fine. Like we, you can just be Robbie Hunter and this will just be like, you know, your band, like your guys. And uh, he's like, no. And then we did, we just, you know, how you go through, like, I don't know if we went through the, I can't remember the specific process. I don't think we ever had any other alternative band names. We never drew shit out of a hat or anything like that. But he was just like, no, like, fine. We'll be Robbie Hunter band. And we're like, fuck, okay. Like, fine. <laughs> And then, <laughs> well, then then we were, and we we're just like, well, that's fine, you know, that's it, that's what it is, like until f- further notice. And then we had um, that first album that we ended up calling Magic City Hippies. At first, it was like three singles we had out, and this is like summer of 2013, something like that. Mm-hmm. Or no, exactly that. And uh, it, it just a couple of things back when the blogs were important and and stuff, like some things kind of caught on online, you know, in a way it was beyond like our calculation. And so you just feel really lucky when like people who you don't know personally or who aren't even part of the local scene are, are responding to the music and right. stuff with like, you know, hype machine and whatever, like stuff was kind of starting to move with it. And we're like, well, now we're, we're screwed. Now we're Robbie Hunter band. Like we didn't know, we don't know how we did this. We were no, not architects of any of this, like little, like beginning indie success at all. And so we're like, okay, we can't like, you know, change like the breadcrumbs that would like lead anybody to all this music. We'd be starting over. It took a few years. That so that was 2013 and 2015. That was when, when we, that record came out, Hippie Castle, when, right? Yeah, Hippie Castle EP, and that's when we were like, "All right, this shit's gonna, about to pop." We're yeah. gonna, yeah. Well, now it was actually crickets too. Like when we released, we released like what we thought was going to be the biggest song on that um, EP, and I remember and under Magic City Hippies, first release under Magic City Hippies, uh-huh. and there was no, actually the number one before that was there was another song that was kind of released under both but that was like a little under the radar 
But I remember we released it and it was like nothing like the stuff that had been happening, you know, with their older music. And we're like, shit, okay, we did it. We're like, we're starting over. Like, I don't know if anyone knows we're the same band. I don't know if any of our fans are following us from that to this. Like, how do we do that? Do, you know, what PR wise, like, what do we do? And then, you know, it was just kind of like that. And we released the EP, you know, all at once. And it wasn't even a single fanfare. It was like the, the intro track, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and that, and that just, you know, like some crazy, you know, early Spotify days, like stuff, some perfect storm of like, I don't know, thank, thank God for the, the internet, you know, the local scene was like, definitely like, you know, birthed us out of that. But like, I don't know, it it was just crazy how how people got a hold of something that we, they they just, you know, knew more than we did about which music of ours like mattered. (laughs) And it just kind of, you know. Grew legs and ran around the internet. Well, shout out to millennial marketing, baby. Let's go. Spotify. <laughs> Give my boys some money. Let's fucking go. Okay. So that's pretty wild. And I, I want to talk about the two, 2015 and on. But I first want to talk about 2013, 2014. What the fuck were you guys up to? Wh- why did you name it the Hippie Castle? Because there must have been some crazy shit going on in this Hippie Castle. Did you all move into the Hippie Castle? Give me some stories. Were there hookers, blow? I want the whole thing. Give it to me. I mean, it was it was someplace that, you know, me and Pat were in and Robbie was like in and out. You know, we stayed there for five years. Like I said, it was supposed to be something that kind of rotated through the music school and then we kind of just stayed. Was it cheap to live in? Like what? Oh, yeah. I paid my first year. I, I lived in like a Florida room. So I didn't live in a real room. I had like sliding glass doors for two of the walls. And then it was also the route to the pool. Yeah, he lived in the pool room, kind of. Yeah. Oh my so God. I paid $350 a, a month though. So <laughs> it was it was definitely worth it. Hold uh, on, how many people lived in the hippie castle? Or with one wow. bathroom, four men, one bathroom. The whole yeah, band well, we in? usually we usually had a semi. It was kind of like the the feeder program for living in the castle after someone moved out. Was you lived on our couch for like <laughs> as long as maybe like six months or so. This and sounds that, like that a fucking a frat times. house, boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very like. It was kind of more of a you know musician like a uh, bohemian version of it. As you could call yeah. it that. But basically, we'd play this gig every Friday night, and then whoever wanted to come over would come over. For you know, and stay, we'd stay up till the sunrise, so like 10 in the morning, you know, in the yeah. pool, you know, we, you know, jump off. We, I mean, I probably pretty unsafe, but we'd be drinking, doing drugs, jumping off the roof naked into the pool, you oh know, and it was just like this, but our, our, you know, our social group was like musicians. So also like any given day, you'd walk in without having to knock and there'd be like 10 people hanging out, someone playing guitar, you know? So it was very, it wasn't like all the time, just like, go, go, go. It was a lot of like, you know, art was being made and stuff like totally. that. Totally. And the house kind of exuded that. It had, you know, there's already these, like people had painted the, the walls. It had much. a, it had a lot of character. It was a, kind of like um, crystallized from the '70s a little bit. Like our landlord Lenny, um, Hell him yeah. And our, him, yeah, Lenny. His name is Lenny. Bob, Hell yeah. His name is Lenny, and our next door neighbor Bob. They were best friends since like the early, or since like the mid '60s, and they were Lenny was a sound guy, and Bob was like a cameraman. They did like, I don't. know. They had done some like. National Geographic shit at some point a long time ago. They did like the original like United Way NFL ads and stuff like that. Um, but they were they'd been all over the place together, and they were like you know OG hippies. Like Bob uh, told me stories. He used to live in like the commune with Ken Kesey. Holy and, shit! Like, yeah, like you know. So these guys they they settled down down there in Miami and uh, built that house. Like built half of it. You can kind of tell what was part of the original you know, skeleton of it and what was the rest of they turned like the, I, the the room I lived in, I think used to be a carport or something. They dug that pool <laughs> themselves. Yo, <laughs> what the fuck is going on at this? If you can, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Robbie, did you move into yeah. this house with these guys? They, they would never, they will never say that I officially lived there, but I did. Live there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my girlfriend at the time, Stephanie lived in a room and I, basically lived there too at all times we recorded the whole album there it's you know, so together. cool man yeah. I, it's like, it, it reminds me of like incubus morning view you know when those guys all moved into that house in malibu oh, and oh, i felt like that's like that. the, yeah. that's the greatest record they made so it was like do you feel like that house bonded you guys to do this forever i i you know the music lives on you know the 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 
the zeitgeist of the house lives on in the music, you know, forever. You know, there's no, the house is destroyed. It's gone now. There's oh. like a three story condo there. It has two addresses. Oh, two addresses. damn. Rest in peace, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Here, let's cheers to the house because right, that, cheers to the house. Cheers to the right, house. There yeah, dude. Rest Salute. in peace, house. Because there's it, it's a, it's an amazing because like it basically grew your friendship. It basically grew confidence in your musicianship to change the band name to a real band as a partnership. Yeah. So okay, so the house you guys are going naked, dicks out, jumping into the pool. The homies living in the parking lot in the garage. I mean, like you got a lot of things are happening. So, 2015, you make this record, that this EP, um, Hippie Castle. At first, when you first like in the beginning, you're like, oh fuck, this thing's gonna pop, and then it doesn't pop for a little bit. Were you discouraged? It was definitely like we said. You know, we probably were a little ahead of ourselves, thinking like. We'll never be bigger than the Robbie Hunter band, or it was like that name was so important, <laughs> even though all we had was like some hype machine hype. You know, there's no, I love no it. Stream, <laughs> no money, so we were like, man, we really, you know, like we blew it in some ways. But uh, you know, it, we I remember that single "Burnt" came out, uh, which is probably my favorite song off the EP. Came out in like June, I think, right at the beginning of the summer, and then the EP came out at the end of summer, and then. We had a we had a pretty big like album release thing from Miami. We had like a couple hundred people, like five hundred maybe. It was free though, free. So That's it's okay. not like you know. We don't need to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you sold that bitch out to me, dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's there's trauma. It. There was a lot of worry about that. We're like, but there were people there, and it was great. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, then, but then I think it was like almost two months later, where Fanfare. What was what exactly? It got on a Spotify playlist. Yeah, it was. It was like I mean, these were the. The early, the early the early days of yeah, Spotify. The gold rush of Spotify. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was like, you know, and Fresh Finds is still important. Um, I think that breaks or starts, it's like the first domino for a lot of people with the, you know, being put in the favor, the good favor of the algorithm, you know. But uh uh yeah, I think re- we always had some people on Reddit, you know, there's always be subreddits, like people just kind of tossing a song of ours up there, even like from the Robbie Hunter band stuff. And uh I don't know where the I don't know who the Fresh Finds people were or are or like you know what their process is for like finding stuff that they don't think anyone's heard but they put fanfare on there and you know i think it just i don't know it went i don't know viral within the spotify you know universe and so it ended up the a number one global viral Sick. top 50 and we just saw we were seeing like streams like we've never had before and we, before this we were all soundcloud too so we're like excuse me we were like um like oh there's gonna be like like I guess some like money like here you know because before, <laughs> before it was all it was all just social currency it was just yeah. just for our handshakes our... and high fives <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> or, and you know thank God I don't know like that's what's evolved into you know what obviously gets reabsorbed by by the band just to keep this sort of thing going and and put on a bigger show and and keep making music but that yeah as we can of it just got kicked around um, on Spotify and. You know, that, I don't know. That, it'll be, it's crazy. You know, it's like, that's the ones, it's always the one you have like this gut feeling about. And then if you try to be your own A&R man or something, you just get in the way of it. You're like, oh no, but this is what, this is the song of summer, you know, or yeah. this is the, whatever, you know, put it. You, we I never know. pick winners. We we yeah. have, we have no idea how to pick winners. We just, they're just going to keep making music. Yeah. And, fuck you know, it. I'm going to clap to that. Fuck it. You know? We don't need to, we don't need to, we don't need to decide destinies. We just no, make good music. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I got a question. So 20 million, you get 20 million views. You wake up and you're like, holy fuck, there's like all these millions of views on our song. When did the vultures start coming? When did the managers start coming? When did the agents, all these fucking sharks, give me give me those details now. Like, were they, I want to hear the worst. I want to hear like the porn star managers who wanted to manage oh, you and all that shit. Give me all the dirt. They have that. <laughs> I mean, a, a shit ton of people started flooding into our emails and stuff. And, you know, or, you know, I don't think we had, we didn't have like a real man. We had a, we had a manager at that time, Spencer Bateman. We love you, Spencer. Shout out. Uh, but we didn't, you know, we didn't have like an industry guy at that time. Sp- uh, Spencer kind of funded, um, well, here's yeah. someone we met at, you know, at Barracudas, yeah. you know, who <laughs> Hell yeah. had, had other, uh, well, he had other like ventures and stuff, you know what I mean? And had, some money to play around with and was just interested in music. And he actually like, he helped buy us some of the the gear that we made, like the, both of those records with, honestly. And then I think it, it got to a point 
we were all kind of out of our elements. Wild West with Spotify and this right. is happening. We're like, what's next? And then we realized we all kind of know the same amount. You know, we didn't have a manager that's like, okay, guys, right. awesome. Here's what we do now. It yeah. was like, uh, we're all just like kind of on the, the same level. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think a little bit of time went by and then we were kind of self managing for the most part. We were just playing a lot locally. We were like, didn't, we had just figured out how to start playing our records live, you know, because it wasn't the records were kind of far from what we sounded like when we were like just jamming at Kudas when we started. You know what I mean? We yeah. were kind of and you're making playing. a record with all these tracks on it, and you know, yeah. you just got to make it sound great. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like we were maybe not prepared to. What, what's but that? Irony is like the original trio is like I'm playing bass and Pat's playing drums and Robbie's playing guitar and singing, but in the studio is all flipped on its head. Pat was playing bass and keys, a bit of guitar. I was playing mostly lead guitar. So like literally the version in the studio was like a different band almost than live. Like yeah. It was translating. It was a whole, it's a translation process really. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so, so we weren't even, yeah, we weren't even ready to like tour all this stuff, but at, at, there was a certain point where we were, we were like, what's okay. What do we, what do we do? And then that's when we eventually got an agent first, right? Someone came, came out to, to represent us to try to, get us out on the road to get us um, some more money for playing live and just, you know, help us in that way. And he was like, okay, so y'all yeah, like, don't really have a manager right now. And we're like, no. And so then that's when the speed dating, there was kind of like a speed dating phase of like, well, how about this guy? Oh, how about this guy? And people flying into Miami and we do like a little, you know, <laughs> schmooze and like, it would just, you know, like a first date vibe with like several managers and like some of them had like a binder thick like contract already like oh. ready to go We're like oh no no nope. yeah, it's like pass thanks for lunch yeah. later <laughs> and then uh i don't know what's uh, some other ones i don't know yeah, yeah. that was what was the worst one what was the oh, what was the greasiest one give me the grease don't tell me his name but give me a grease we had a guy fly in uh and i remember he he was like a 65 year old man we picked him up at the airport. He was me and Rob picked him up from the airport after work. He was like in Robbie's car. He was like a sick old man. He was like sniffling, and he we drove into his hotel and he gave me and Robbie like sixty bucks to go buy a bottle of vodka. And we went back to his hotel and drank uh, uh, vodka sprites or vodka sodas. We went out. He spent a lot of money. And Pat joined us later. We were like hammered, and he like immediately wanted like a cut a 360 deal on everything and he, like he <laughs> yo here's up. the deal now you're a vodka bottle down <laughs> yeah <laughs> yo okay here's the deal i take 40 percent. you guys yeah. shut the fuck up we'll get you famous okay here we go i talk like that too and so he's like, yeah. i'm gonna be your label i'm gonna be your publishing and i'm gonna be your manager and he's like i know it sounds like there's a conflict of interest there but i promise you there's not and he couldn't really explain why there's not <laughs> you know oh my God. Uh, and you know, we always just had, and he sent down his assistant like a month later to do the same thing. And his he, IT guy, he said, IT guy, that's it's right. A, it's his, <laughs> it's his, it's his son who yeah. lives in the house. I felt like it. But we always had the wherewithal to be like, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's a classic history that you find someone in the industry that shows up and can then kind of, you know, do the smoke and mirrors and impress you and you sign away some big chunk of money. Right. And I don't know, we were just we kind of knew we had something and we had already kind of gotten where we were without having all that, that we were, I don't know. We just maybe had a good sense of like, nah, how close like, was he to signing you? Or do you always knew you're never going to sign him? I think miles away. <laughs> Damn. You almost got Britney Spears, dog. <laughs> <laughs> After we were like, Nope, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. 10 years later, we'd be like free magic hippies, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He was really sick too, and wouldn't drink any of the alcohol that. He oh, made he was trying to manipulate, dude. He was trying to drug y'all. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Wow. We had a Brazilian guy come up, and he met with I think me and Pat or me and Robbie in like the parking lot of like a Mexican restaurant. The with, Brazilian like, guy. That's that's yeah. I wasn't there. I think you guys went. Oh, with Pat, and he had like a slideshow on his laptop. We all like presentation. Yeah, we all like gathered. Yeah. On tiny laptop. Oh my god, I forgot about that. Did he drive Bro, a minivan? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> a translator kind of guy that kind of helped explain it but like and like his whole thing was like look at my slides and it was these it like, like stock photos of like a band like here's <laughs> you know what I mean? like, <laughs> are you for is this real dudes yeah it, it was kind of the opposite because it's like well the last guy at least wine and dined us we're like outside of like a like a you know local chipotle that's closed we have the laptop on like the table and they're like sweeping and like they're up on the table you know and he's like i don't know how to say this in english so we're like okay i don't i don't know so 
we kind of passed on that. We had we had some local people that like had worked with some people, you know, people that they were just like, no, like I can tell this you're you're also trying to like use us to kind of boost your career. Right. We were kind of looking for someone who'd come in and be like, I am a manager, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, there's those. Th- I mean, like literally hitting that ceiling of like, oh, we need like we need help, like we need new insight, you know, into like kind of where to go from here. And everyone else knew at most as much as we did, and we felt like, especially the old, like the first. You know, dude, we mentioned, I think the, that was just more old school, like someone kind of, uh, maybe uh, arrogantly approaching management, artist management nowadays, like not really knowing how much has changed about it. Like there's so much more autonomy, you know, with releasing your own music and owning your masters and all stuff where we're like, well, we don't need, you know, we don't need to like break off a piece like we had, this is all self-contained right now. And as we can got to kind of protect it, you know, from. Yeah, from stuff you used to you used to be able to like almost gaslight an artist into thinking like, oh no, yeah, I actually no, that's actually how it is. Like you actually don't make that much money, and they're just yeah. like, oh, I guess not. And then everyone would just talk to each other and be like, yep, same thing with me. I signed this contract, and like, <laughs> apparently that's not recouped yet, or what? You know what I mean? It's just like, well, yeah. I mean, you look at the horror start. stories like Bootsy Collins, George Porter, these guys who sign these contracts not knowing what it is and lose all their publishing, and like just to make a, just to get, you know, I don't know about George or. But like a lot of these guys, like to get famous quicker, mm-hmm. you know, or not know what the knowledge is. So, and I like what you said about keeping it simpatico. You know, you got to know your worth, right? People are, they don't know their worth in this industry because there's so many people trying to take a little piece and a little piece and everyone's taking their little piece. What's left for the band? So like, how long did it take you to find your team? Yeah, can we talk about how we wind and dine Brad? Actually, yeah, so, yeah, so Brad's been our manager for uh, six years now. Well, yeah. let's go back to Phil for a sec. So that okay. age, Phil, we love Phil, a real legend. Phil is based out of Colorado, uh, and so we what, what agency was he with? Madison House. Madison House. So that, but we, he's not. Yeah, he's with yeah. a new. Yeah, but we kind of we we kind of ended up being jam band adjacent through Phil. Yeah. And so like with that that kind of shifted the people coming to us, right? Because he kind of introduced us to that world. And that's where Brad comes in, right? Yeah. So it's, you know what Art Basel is in Miami? No. It's like this really bougie. Now it's even more just like for the rich people, but it's like this art thing that's all about like the best parties and all these extravagant things. Like socialite shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, But it's know, like almost like, so, it's at the same time, it's almost like... um south by or something like oh, that okay. but in my because like there's stuff that's not official basel yeah and art basel stuff that's happening throughout the city you know for that oh, entire cool. time. It's kind of you have like a banana duct tape to the wall and they're like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> but we'll pay it oh you know? yeah sold <laughs> that's not even that's not yeah that that was a literally a piece that yeah. was yeah no robert didn't make that up but uh <laughs> but, but, but it's cool it's it can be cool you know there's like all these amazing artists you know from overseas and and just famous artists from the states and stuff play and and uh everyone's down there and so it's like the city's crazy you know for this is in december every year um and so it's just the perfect timing for someone who's like very unfamiliar with so this is brad our, our current manager who's been a manager for years um this was the final speed date and it just seemed like the stars <laughs> aligned for he was like, okay well i'll come down you know we had talked to him i think on the phone a couple times or whatever and he's like yeah well I'll come down you know check out a thing and we were playing like uh a Lululemon. Wait, wait the, like, before the night before, we there's two shows. He came to the on Saturday. We played at the Yard. Women Yard was this old place where you could pack like a couple hundred people. It's always a free show, like mm-hmm. a thousand people. You could. It was, pack. It's it a was, huge place. Yeah, yeah, it was a big, and, yeah, and big beer was, garden. Oh, you know. And I remember that night, I was like super hammered. I remember I met him like barely, very barely coherent. We had a great show. We got to kind of show out for him. Like, look at all these people that came. And then the next day, Pat, we played the Lululemon thing. You talk about that. The Lululemon, yeah, it's like fancy yoga apparel. So it's just like yeah. a bunch of beautiful yoga people, you know, in Miami around. And they rented out a mansion on the Venetian, like off of the Venetian Causeway. So like just, you know, water on like both sides of this little, oh my God. like just the yeah. most amazing Miami shit. And yeah, we played and we invited him to that. And so we we're hanging out, you know, and after we played and drinking and everything, and there was like a TP there. And like, we, we were all like faded and we like sat in the TP and talked about music and like you know you know it was just like this. we were so drunk yeah Robbie, I, I was so fucking drunk i can't even tell you i, I we, we drank so much and this is the time where we're like inking the deal you know um, not, not literally though but that's that was the other thing is like 
really like management is such a close, like tight knit relationship with an artist that if, if it's not working out, you would never want to be stuck in it. You right. know what I mean? Right. So it's like that good management stuff, I think tends to begin with like no formal contract. You just start, you know, working together on a basis of good faith and everything. That's how it began. Obviously, you know, we have like a, a contract and everything We've been working for a while, but, but that's, yeah, kind of how it was like, let's, Hey, let's start let's get to work on this. Like, let's start working together. And it just felt right. You know how it is when you, when you meet somebody, you know, yeah. it's just the same thing, except it's we're three dudes. Yeah. yeah. We're in a we're hut, it. <laughs> like literally like palm frond hut, you know, we're all sitting yeah. legged on the floor holding, you know, like, a I love it. I mean, it's, it, and, you know, intoxicated or not. I mean, you know, when a good person comes into your life, I've yeah. been with my manager for seven years and we fight all the time. I want to kill that motherfucker sometimes, yeah. but I love him. You know, it's, and he's, it's all, we're all stubborn, you know, cause I'd rather be passionate, you know, and fight for something that's worth it than just like shoot away, you know, mm-hmm. it's a partnership. Mm-hmm. Well, this is crazy. Okay. So 2015, I know we talked a lot about 2015. Now let's get it. Okay. Band starting to pop, doing festivals, you got fucking women singing your songs, cougars. I see a lot of cougars at your shows. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Now let's let's flash forward to now where you put out a new record and I heard that you quarantined the whole record in Montana, Los Angeles, and Miami. Yep. It was the first time, obviously, for many bands, I, I imagine. But yeah, hold the first on. Time so you ever... guys didn't meet at all? No, no we no, we no, we, we, did. we did. Had studio to to I mean that's where the magic from the band has to come from, is you know, us together in a room because because when we're recording uh together which our process before the quarantine was like four nights a week till three in the morning together so we had a very like yeah real like lunch pair like work our ass off in the studio thing but the process was whoever played the best guitar part it got on the record whoever thought of the best lyric that's what it became so it's very kind of democratic so we still always need that to really put the magic on the songs mm-hmm. we need to meet together but that was how many sessions like we flew out to la four times and each was like a week so in person, it still only comes Something down. like that. Yeah. The first one was the most, it, it was like we had in, in, in the middle of 20. So I'm, I drank a coffee and I'm drinking a Perrier. So I'm like, no, I'm it's, yeah, it's, like two, it's eight in the morning here, but I took a full yeah. pot, dude. I'm like, Let's yeah, no, seriously. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we were fully, yeah, obviously fully like locked down. Right. Cause we, we finished our tour. We did a national tour. We were out for like two months and we finished, we got back like February March was 1st. it a leap year? Think- like 29th or something? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 like March 1st. We celebrated because it was like the first time we ever like made any money <laughs> on the road. And then um, I remember like three days after that, the world ended, right? So it's like yeah. we got to, we were so lucky. We got to like finish our tour. There's so many people who canceled tours right then right. or who were interrupted in the middle of it. And uh, and then, yeah, it was like, okay, there was, so there was that little lull of like, we had just toured this record. And so there wasn't a pressing you know, thing to start making music, but it was like, well, what else is there to do? And obviously we were going to start making music together anyway, just it's what we do. Um, and so, yeah, that's like full, like through that summer, you know, the rest of that year, that's like kind of full lockdown and demos were just getting passed around. Like John and Robbie, they both had their own production setups going and, um, you know, they'd send me and let me kind of like, you know, uh, unapologetically like mangled certain things and see like what we're down with. Uh, and it was just so different. Like before that in Miami, um, live, you know, when we lived at the castle and then even after that, when we had other spots we were working out of, it was still like a four nights a week from like 10 PM to like 3 AM mm-hmm. thing, like a constant, you know, seeing each other almost, almost every day and being in the room together and, and, you know, not having a certain amount of preciousness with the time and the experimentation and everything. Right. And this was more kind of, uh, like a game of battleship or something. It was like, you have like this fully formed idea for right. something. You're, you're already self-conscious about it. You're like, kind of clean it up. And then you push like send on like, send yeah, it you're like you wait to send it to the band. Like, fuck, should I send this? Like, fuck, yeah. fuck, fuck, fuck. That, that process seems like when you guys are such collaborators together and have to be in the room, that different process would kind of fuck up a band's mojo. Did it fuck up your guys' mojo? Did you fight a lot during the quarantine? Like, give me all those deeds. It, it was so nice. I mean, for me personally, uh, before it used to be Robbie would just do voice notes on his phone. Oh. So what he was getting sent in was just like a very lo-fi, like acoustic guitar and vocal thing. Uh-huh. So 
right at the beginning of the quarantine, I finally bought a laptop. I hadn't had one for years and I got a production set up. Robbie was actually producing his demos. And Pat, you know, as our always been the producer and kind of the the real, you know, everything has to pass through him, his mind and his fingers to be, get to the other end. My fingers. <laughs> Let's yeah. go, Pat. Okay. <laughs> I see what's going on now. I'm I'm getting this. I'm getting the Okay, the keep engine, going. The producer in the engine of little the Tom whole. Brady over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Only in looks. Yeah. <laughs> Hot in the brains. <laughs> so so you know, me and Robbie are actually sending in things where it's like, I have programmed some drums. You know, I, 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 I did a little bit of, you know, arranging. There's more, there's guitars, there's bass and stuff like that. And I think, Pat, you can speak for this, but I think receiving something that had, that wasn't just like a vocal line and a guitar kind of made your job different. But I wouldn't say easier, but it, it, you could do your job differently because you were receiving something that had a bit of a, of a built out body to it instead of just a kernel of idea. And I, I, I remember sending in stuff and you being like, I really like this. And then being like, yes. You're like, oh, I, fuck, thank God. <laughs> yeah, I remember the first time that you're, I sent in something I, and Rob was like, oh, this is cool. And Pat didn't respond. And then the next day, and Pat was like, I woke up thinking about your song. And I was like, okay, all right. And I think there's something about that. I think we were all in a very, like, pop, because it was new to all of us, we were more open-minded than we'd ever been. I, yeah. I remember being like, this feels really good. Like getting just the response back and forth, like, it was very encouraging, you know, like, I don't know, it felt because it was new to all of us that we had to go into it with this very like optimistic outlook, you know, and, and I think that worked out really well. So I, I got a question about, okay, so Pat, you basically got to play psychiatrist here a little bit when someone brings some trash to you, right? <laughs> well, when the, I, so I, I think maybe I have some, uh, I think maybe my habits like working with other artists who I don't know as well, or maybe, uh, Maybe I have some work to do with that <laughs> compared to how I'm able to. I well, no, it's like we're like brother. You know how it yeah, is with exactly. Things? Like there, there's a veneer of politeness or of there, there's like there's no reason not to be just like totally honest. You know, yeah, I think like we, when you're with your brothers, it's blunt. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's like this blunt. is shit. This is shit. We're not doing it. <laughs> Give me the. Yeah, see, I gotta, I gotta wait to you know even talk to anyone if I'm hungover because I'll just start talking shit even if I don't even listen to. So give me an example of when a song, maybe Robbie or Tom gave you a song and it was just totally crap, and you're just like, I don't want to fucking ruin. Give, give me, give, give me a demo. Give me, give me some of that. Well, I've gotten. I mean, I guess it's all the the dynamic has been like i'm like the funnel or like the bottleneck of ideas or something like that but at the end of the day i mean we're nothing i don't ever get my way or robbie doesn't get his way or john doesn't get his way at the expense of someone else being really like not down <laughs> with something i think we're lucky that we're we triangulate you know in a way where like usually we have some pretty good faith in the fact that the thing that makes all three of us like react is better than you know maybe the one direction that one of us was pulling it or something um and we're we get excited about a lot of the same things and music and grooves and arrangements and so it's like we're lucky that there's there's not this like crazy you know divergent thing there's no like i don't know lennon mccartney thing or i don't know um like, but i think i think uh i mean one time sometimes i will i need to play around with stuff right so it's like you need you know you need to like play like as right. an adult even even if your job is to maybe take what you're given and mix it or whatever. I don't, sometimes it's just like, Oh, if I'm not getting, I realize like, well, if I'm not getting what I want or something, I need to like be able to throw, you know, the whole fucking thing out the window and, mm -hmm. and like really just do it with like no, no boundaries, no rules. And sometimes that can be insulting or I can go <laughs> in a direction where it's like, you really kind of disregarded someone's idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Without telling them like, uh, Oh, great dude. Okay. I'm going back to this. <laughs> But there's, I don't know, this is, I mean, this is from, this isn't from this past album process, but we have like an inside joke about, uh, there was one song we have called Four of a Kind that turned out really pretty, like this pre-chorus in it, these guitar parts that we ended up with are, are really nice. But in the process of figuring that out, I definitely like tried some things out, like sent some emails, you know, with like some ideas I had that <laughs> I just remember everyone was so the pressure was on. We needed to get this. We already had our like EP release party like scheduled and like all this stuff. Like, we need to get this done. And it's like, Pat, what are you doing? I like made this pre-course that had these like 
kind of like it. Robbie called Robbie came back and he's like, Pat, no, I don't like your fucking like roadhouse guitars. That you just <laughs> <laughs> something like that, like real like like a rock riff. We're like, That's oh awesome. my god, this is amazing, dude. <laughs> I, I have one. I, so I remember for this record, uh, I recorded this like a uh, little loop and I arranged some parts on it and I put like a guitar melody over it, right? And I and then so the guy's like, oh, that's cool. And then I made a song with that melody and I kind of like made this whole thing and I sent it in. And Pat was like, it's cool. Uh, I think the melody is still best served as a guitar part. I remember that was like Pat's very nice way of being like, I think the best version of this is the original thing, which is a guitar thing and not this whole song you made. So that was a very like nice way to say like, nah, not, not, not this one, not going on the record, you know? Yeah. Take this cute shit away. I could see Pat just being a fucking boss up in here in this shit. Like <laughs> you, you could be sweet, Pat, but I could see you just slapping shit away left oh, and yeah. right. Just like a, like a fly swapper. I think he's right. When he says it, although Pat is the funnel, Oh, the, end, the hardest thing is <laughs> the hardest thing is impressing all three of us. I bet, like, man. That, that is the hardest thing. We're impressing the other two. Like no matter what, like there isn't, you know, I don't know. There isn't really ever a time where me and Robbie love something and Pat hates it or whatever. It's like it's this thing is like it only gets to the end of the funnel if all three of us are super yeah. excited about it, you know. But that does happen, and I think that's like the beauty of like the three of us. So two of us can try and convince the third person that. We think that this is the right idea, right? And like, so, but if if somebody, if the third person like vehemently does not like this idea, we won't do it. You know, it just won't happen. But you know, there are times where we can kind of like come together and be like, "Hey, like, really, we really think this is the right move." And I think that's kind of like the beauty. It's very flexible, but it's like also very democratic, and it works really well. I think, Robbie, I got, I got, yes, I got a question for you, no, Robbie. So. Yeah. Your whole life has been a solo band, busking, yada, yada. How long did it take you to work as a team? A lot of beer and a lot of barracudas. Uh, you know, we had a lot of great times. Um, I think ever, that, it's a that mind state. We were boys. We were just boys the whole time, you know, and, and it kind of just came from just like being friends. You know, it, it was just we're just hanging out. No, I'm, I'm talking about it's more of like, you know, the idea of like, all right, I'm a solo band, you know, mm -hmm. and now I have to work in a collaborative working space. So when yeah. you put out a, like the first song, you show the boys and, like, and Pat's like, nah, fuck this. <laughs> how <laughs> how long did it? The very first song, Robbie, <laughs> it, I was like, hey. I was like, hey, will you let me like produce some of your songs? And he's like, yeah, sure. How about this one? I was like, fuck that. No, <laughs> <laughs> but there, I mean, like that's it's like that's prison. Like, you got to beat up the biggest person. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's how you get respect. Yeah, the producer. Yeah. It's been Robbie the master Street. plan the whole time. These boys want to <laughs> change the band name <laughs> to Magic. Robbie's surprisingly egoless since like day one. I, I can tell, man. Remember that. And it definitely, it also started because you're right. It did start as a solo thing. But the way it started was. Robbie wrote the, you know, all the songs that are on the Robbie Hunter band record. But it was even before I was playing with them, they were they already started working on that record separate from the live thing. So it was very much like it was Robbie, but Pat was like taking Robbie's songs and exploding them into something new, you know. And then I kind of came in yeah. and helped fix that. Such that, like, I think Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like you were always kind of handing off your stuff in some way. Like you, 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 you bring this thing in and then we come in, like Pat said, and we just fucking play with it and fuck it up and make it completely different. So you've always kind of surrendered. Surrendered always been something you've been doing the moment that it gets emailed over. The voice note gets sent and you're already kind of like, well, like my, my ego here is already asked well because we're playing my song. You know, we're like they are my songs. They're happening. And I never saw you go like, you know what? When I wrote this song, this was not my fucking, that was not the point of this song. What are you doing with this? You know, you never came from the perspective like they came from me. Therefore, it has to be what I want. You know? Yeah, you're so, you're a team player. That was, that was the precedent of the whole thing. He had never met me and I, he had never heard me play drums. And he just told <laughs> my friend, Sean, yeah, let's have, <laughs> yeah, let's have a drummer. You know, <laughs> that's why he's stuck in fucking Montana right now, dog. <laughs> team players is stuck in Minnesota because he's seen his chick, dog. Okay, I like this. I, oh man, I think it's it's so refreshing to see a front man be a team player, you know, because that's how I am too. And a lot of front men, you don't see that in bands. They think it's them, even when it's a partnership. So I'm gonna say kudos to your fucking friendship, boys. Let's go. I like it. I fucking like it. 
I fucked with you guys. I like. I knew I'd like you, motherfuckers, the minute I saw you on that stage in Raleigh. Okay, question. I know we're running out of time. Robbie, when's your flight? You got a, you got a little bit? Uh, like, yeah, I got to leave in like half an hour. Okay, so cool. Good. Let's do yeah. two, quest, two more questions. Okay. Are you proud of the process of this new record? Yes. I think it's, it's some of the best shit we've ever done easily. Why and, do you think uh, that? You know, it's, it's just, it's that shit that we're talking about. Like when we're in a room together, there is literal magic. You can actually feel it, you know? And maybe yeah. it's just us in the beginning of like the birthing process of the music, but it's just, if you feel it right there, you know, it's going to translate on the other end to yeah. people. And fucking awesome. I don't know. There's just some really beautiful moments on this record. We're just, I think really proud of it. There so. is proof. There is proof in that. It's like, this is because we started all these things totally separately with like, like we said, you know, the, the kind of self critical battleship of like <laughs> containing, wrapping up your, your idea and sending it. Um, but then we realized we're like, Oh, we would, we met up the first time like that summer or like at the end of that summer of 2020. And then after that, like the new versions, you know, we had of everything. We're like, oh shit, okay, yeah, this matters a lot. You know, like getting together in person matters a ton. It's suddenly the songs are, you know, we already had chords and cool sounds and and everything. You know what I mean? A lot of the lyrics were already fleshed out, but like the thing that kind of gave it just, you know, the the intangible thing that we had, you know, unknowingly just developed over the past, you know, several years. Um, got injected into it and so, so we got to see that firsthand because but before we're like well maybe maybe it would be the same whatever and then we got to try it yeah it's very real and it's extra magic because you guys haven't you guys have been with each other for fucking 10 years and then you guys haven't like every day you know you know how you how, how your shit smell everything yeah. that like took a year to get away from each other to wake up and come back and say oh shit this mat this this magic is important you know I got one last question. I'm, I'm going to clap up to you motherfuckers. Let's go, Magic City hippies. I like you guys. I think we should tour together. I think it'd be a good combo. Love that. Fuck Talk, yeah. to, what the fuck? I'm going to talk to Brad. What or yeah. I'm Ben Baruch. I'm like, yo, Ben, get me on tour with the, the hippies. And then, yeah, like, ah, you know, they're real big, Frasco. The real, I'm like, fuck you, Ben. <laughs> I don't know, man. Your show's pretty wild. I, I would hate I would hate to to have to every night. I'll tone like, it down. I'll tone it down. You on that stage. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What the hell am I gonna do? Yeah. You know? Uh I got one last question. It's almost your 10 year anniversary. Report it's report card season, baby. What <laughs> 10 years in a band? You know, ups and downs. Doesn't seem like there are a lot of down moments. Um, but like it's 10 years. So it's like you've been together 10 years. What have you learned from the experience? What have you feel like you could grow on in the next 10 years of your band? Give me um give me your analysis of this 10 and going into the next 10. Damn. Well, okay. so the the title of the last record was Water Your Garden, right? Which is a song John wrote for his partner. Um Hell but yeah. it also but like for it to become it's about a lot of things. I think John could speak to that, but like I think for it to become the album title, the process was that was kind of something we realized uh, putting this record together and you know, everything we've been kind of all the si decisions we've been making together for the past like year and a half in particular was the pandemic kind of allowed us to um, we were shelving a lot of uh, a lot of personal life stuff, you know, to like go balls to the wall with the band to be spending so much time. Uh, on tour um it's kind of like a little bit of tunnel vision and there was you know i, th I think that's like inevitably part of every artist or band stories there's a point where you're just like you're going for it and like nothing else matters and it's just it can kind of get to that threshold where it, don't, where it could burn out because you realize you're ignoring other things or you're ignoring taking care of yourself um so i think you know we we kind of learned you know the fact that robbie you know we were able to make this record and robbie was with his partner in in montana you know and i at the time you know i've I'd been long distance for a long time and i was with my partner at the time out in la and it's like okay we can kind of strike some sort of balance it might always be lopsided toward you know rock and roll or whatever but <laughs> you, you 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 have to kind of yeah you have to it has to come from the, the same same way as like music that's you know mean meaningful and compelling comes kind of from the inside out and everything you know, we have to prioritize that prioritize, like how we're feeling as individuals, you know, how 
our, our personal lives are put together and what our priorities are. Um, and just to be open and, you know, communicate about it and figure out how to not, uh, how to keep steering this ship, but not at the, at, at some grand expense of, of that, you know, well, like now you guys have lives, you know, we're old. Yeah. How old are you guys now? Are you guys what? Twenties, thirties, are you in thirties? We're all in thirties. All in thirties. Yeah. yeah that's true, man. I'm 34. It's that yeah. time of our life where it's like, all right, y- we used to live off of fucking, you know, Red Bull and cocaine and, and, you know, and being single and doing that stuff. And now we're getting that point in our life where we're like, oh, this is going to be our life. So we need to manage both sides of our life because we are also human. We're not just these fucking machines who just yeah. play music and, you know, like, oh, drink beer and <laughs> live in castle, you know, <laughs> like it's just uh, so this weird, the, you know, the narrative of, of art coming from struggle like that, it does have to kind of come from, I think, in conflict in your life. People don't really want to hear a song about how great things are all the time, you know, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like, you know, we were up till three in the morning every night, and you know, working full time. So like I'd yeah. wake up at seven and go work. So you're just exhausted all the time. And, you know, the tour life. But th- there's something that said that even if you're writing from a place of like pain and stuff like that, if you. It's our our best music, I think, is this record because it did come from a place where like we were at least in better we were trying to be in better places ourselves. Yeah. You know. The road like, beat when, you guys up a little bit. Yeah. Well, it just it, there's something about even like a previous record, which I love, but like that was such an arduous process. Like it was like we kind of had more fun making this record again. Mm-hmm. You know, the last record took us like five four years and like in the studio every night and you're really like tearing at i mean we always like work our ass off we take it making the shows are really fun we take the record incredibly seriously like we'll lose our minds over a record that's how Mm. much you know it matters to us but something about i think the music was better because we were coming at it from a place of kind of like you know caring about how you felt a little more you know like something about being a little more whole Meant, made the music better and i don't really know why you know you see those memes where it's like yeah my best record was made in this basement and you see like like it's just like a dungeon you know or yeah. even pat you came in poly didn't he talk about like making a record at like a beautiful like beach or whatever oh, so it takes the pressure off you making beautiful sounds if you have like a beautiful view you'll kind of convince yourself that what you're working on is look at you it. just fucking giving us producer notes like that look <laughs> at that pat god living in la just sunshine smiling <laughs> Probably got like a model girlfriend, Pat. We see you, okay? We see you, buddy. Yeah, it's so true, though, man. When you don't, when there's no pressure, you write the better music. When you open the vessel, you know, when you're forcing shit and like when we work so hard and, you know, it's just, it's such a one track. You're totally right about the tunnel vision. Like you're in this fucking, you're like driving a fucking Formula One car. You don't want to look left or look behind you to see if anyone else is there. You just got to go straight or turn. Yeah. And um, for you to finally take a step back and say, hey, I'm also a human. I got feelings. And then understand the feelings and then put it in your music. And that's why we're musicians, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking Let's go. Fucking go. <laughs> Boys, it's been a pleasure. Robbie, keep... I hope you get out of that fucking Mall of America. Don't spend too much money, buddy. We need you. We need you around. We're being united tomorrow. They're going to both be in Miami. So we're Oh, what are you guys going to do? We're just working on just kind of just... I think what we're trying to do is have a, a little fun. Like, we're, yeah. we're, we got some, like, cover ideas and kind of like a low stakes. Like, we're coming here to try to work it out. Like, some people we cool. record it. I think it's the first time in a while we're going to be in the studio recording something where we're just like... Let's just have fun like it was 10 years ago almost. Yeah. You know, I mean, once, you have a, once you have the shape of a record, like everything's about that and maybe some stuff ends up on it later. Yeah. But, you know, you're dragging this thing along and now we're like, this is like fresh, you know, starting from scratch and yeah. something. So it's, it's exciting. And then the, the boys are they're playing summer camp. Yeah. 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 This is a summer camp episode. We'll, we'll hang out. We'll, we'll be hanging. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll have lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. So throughout, you guys are getting bigger and bigger every year. It makes me happy to see the bros, you know, because you're not really a jam band either. So, and you're in the scene. We're yeah. both we're both stuck in the same predicament a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, throughout the fucking hardships of making it through the industry, don't forget to have fun. Don't forget to smile. Don't forget to sign. Keep signing cougar titties. Do do the whole thing, dog. Seriously, <laughs> go get it because life's supposed to be enjoyed, and it's all not all about work. Even when you love, we love working. I get it. We're workaholics. Your work, I could tell from how you guys talk, you're workaholics like me. Just don't forget to have fun and don't forget about yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Magic Romantic. City Hippies, thanks for being on the show, guys. Cheers. Yeah, Thank let's get it get a hang in, have fun in Miami. Um pour a 40 down next to the the hippie castle for me, will you? Definitely, definitely right. will. Have a good one. Fly safely, Robbie. Boys, Cheers. thanks for being part of the show. Really appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Cheers, buddy. Later, guys. Peace. Hell yeah. Magic City Hippies. All right. Tells you everything about the strand. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to Lake Powell. Lake Powell, everybody. I am. I am. It's I have birthday. been. I realized. Out of town. I know it's your birthday. I'm gonna miss it. I don't really it. care about my birthday. It's fine. I mean, once. Yeah. I'm not nine. You know what I mean? I know, but I still Every would like birthday. to be there for you. But I did get you a gift. I do. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. Oh, weird. I never get birthday presents. Well, I love you. I wanted Ugh. to get you a gift. Ugh. I do feel like I've been on a few too many vacations. The last I two was months. gonna <laughs> rip into you. <laughs> We're kind of low on time. So I know. Maybe on the See, the problem is I book all these vacations when I'm fucking overworked. Let's like, just. Have you ever heard of a staycation? Yeah, yeah, I can, but I can't afford this house. I got to Airbnb <laughs> it. I can't just stay here. That's more expensive than a fucking vacation. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Yo, you're so overextended in your life. I am way overextended, but everything's working out. The Airbnb is killing it. The van company is starting to fucking, it's going to kill. Really? Oh my God. I'm already getting fucking. You need a salesman? Yes. Let me get, let me get that rip though. I'll give you the rip. What's the rip on the rental thing? Let's look, um, let's I got to see stranded. real numbers, but it's, 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 I mean. I'll sell some vans for you. The problem is I'm just. I, I started a business, so I have investors, so I got to pay them back first before you even see any money. Oh, well, fuck investors, right? <laughs> Never pay them. What are they going to do? Sue you for 20 grand? You don't, don't, no, l- it's the not. Lawyer the lawyer costs, you know? It's the ethics, Nick. If you are going to start a business... Ethics? You're running vans. <laughs> for, yes. I'm just kidding. But it's the ethics of starting something. You yeah, don't I'm just joking. fuck anybody. I'm just joking. Be a good person. If someone gave me a bunch of money, I'd be a great person. Will you? Yep, but I'm not going to be a good person until I have a lot of money. <laughs> you heard it from the source. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, interview. fuck. I got to do my... I, can, do you mind if I pitch my shows? Oh, no. Um, Why would I... It's like the whole point <laughs> of having a podcast. Okay. I have all these festivals, and I, I, um, I promised them that I'd, I'd give them all love. Um, oh. Okay, so... Um, May 28th, I'm at Rooster Walk, Hell Axton, yeah. Virginia. I love that festival. I'm going to see Big Something again, Little Feet. It's going to be blast. Oh, sick. Then, the 29th, I am in Chillicothe at Summer Camp. This yep. is the Summer Camp Talk show. about that. I'm only there for a night. Okay. And then, June 3rd, I am in Atlanta, Georgia for Chandler Music Festival with um, Yonder Mountain and Grace Potter. I'm excited to see Yonder. And Grace. Last time I saw Grace, she was peeing in a can. Okay. It was fucking awesome. Oh, yeah, she peed me. on the side of the stage. I'm like, this is fucking rock and roll. So I'm like, I can't wait to let her know that. Then we're at Lafayette, Louisiana the next night, June 5th, with the Cold War kids. Mm. Um, and then on June 5th, we're in St. Augustine for Fool's Paradise. Oh, Kunji. Hey, our boy Kunji. My Kunji bear. That'll be a fun one. We're with Umphreys again and Lettuce, and it's really I know. It's like all my favorite bands. Yeah, it's going to be a fun When's one. When's that again? That's June 5th. Oh, that's right around so the corner. June 4th and 5th, so get your tickets to Fool's Paradise. That's so um, fun. Florida people. It's going to be a blast. And then it's Floyd's Wedding, um, June 10th and 11th. Don't we're care. the house band. I had, oh, to hire, I had to hire Chris because he didn't want to play his own fucking wedding. I love uh, it. I get it. And then um, June 16th, we are in Bonnaroo. Late night set. Big Hell show. yeah. And then June 18th. Oh, you're doing late night at Bonnaroo? Yeah, late night, big stage. How late? Like 11. We're oh, late. that's not that late. No, but that's like prime time. We're gonna that's like, what I'm saying. That's like. We're 1 a.m.? That's pretty on good. On Thursday? Day one? Oh, there's going to be like 15, 20,000 Day one's there. a good. That's going to be huge. Yeah, don't drop the ball, man. I'm not. No, don't have too many people sit in. Then we're back with Bay Bay. Bay Bay. We're at um, Red Rocks on. Yep, I'm doing an after party for that. Do come to the, my after party. I need the I need the money bad oh, yeah. guys. Sean, I'm just our, <laughs> Nick has taken advantage of a situation where he is now the after party of the Red Rocks show. So it's perfect. You get to see Umphreys, you and your favorite Umphreys side character Nick Gerlock. Yes, and you also took my band for the night, right? Well, one just Andrew. a drummer, just a drummer. So come on, buy tickets to that. It's not sold out yet, but it will. That's June 18th, and mm-hmm. then. Um, after this, at, and then we're doing the Bonnaroo, and then in July, we're at Peach Fest, July 1st. And then July 3rd, we fly across the country to High Sierra Music Festival. Ooh, that Sierra Mist. In California. And then, that's all I'll do for now. 
Yeah, I okay. think that's plenty. That's plenty. And then there's a, another 10 festivals in July and August. Okay. That's so fun. I love it. 